Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Well, it looks like it is uh, time to start. It's four o'clock. I mean, for you, it's six. Um, so welcome, everybody. It's good to see you all here this morning. We are honored to have Brother John D. Martin with us this morning from Shippensburg, Pennsylvania. And he's going to be our speaker. Um, some of John's messages on the kingdom have had a significant impact on our lives. Um, most recently, we listened to his message on our world, our wealth. And my wife called me at work at about 10 o'clock in the morning. She had been listening to it and she was in tears. We have to do something. <laughs> um, so if you haven't listened to that, I would strongly recommend it. He's going to share this morning on the Lord's Prayer. Um, while he's speaking, um, be keep in mind that we will be having a question and answer period at the end. Um, so think of some good questions for him. Um, maybe you can introduce yourself, um, John. Well, I was raised as a conference Mennonite and, uh, I watched the apostasy that took place in the conferences and uh, left in 1968. And then in, in 1984, 1986, we began Shippensburg Christian Fellowship. Um, it was an effort to uh, establish a kingdom concept of the gospel rather than a save me concept of the gospel with implications uh, about the way we used our money. Uh, it was, we wanted it to be a church where everybody functioned. You didn't just have a few people uh, ministering with the rest sort of going along for the ride. We wanted to recognize all the talents, uh, have brothers preach as they were able to and had the gift to do it. Uh, so that's, that's what our congregation's vision was. But I, I've been deeply impressed with the Lord's Prayer. But before we get into it, let's, uh, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, I thank you this morning that you gave us this prayer that is all-inclusive. It touches every area of our lives. And Lord, if we could just live this little prayer, uh, we would be uh, beautiful examples of what you want humans to be. So bless us this morning as we think about this prayer. Help us to internalize it. Help us, Lord, to uh, put it to practice in our lives and experience the same kind of results the disciples experienced when they learned to pray the way you taught. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, this prayer was given at the request of the disciples. Uh, they never asked Jesus to teach them to preach. They never asked Jesus to teach them to cast out demons. Uh, they never asked Jesus to teach them uh, uh, any of those things. Uh, this is the only thing they ever said that they wanted Jesus to teach them. And I believe uh, the reason for that was because they sensed that everything else about Jesus' ministry was because uh, he knew how to pray. He knew how to make contact with his father. And uh, so they asked him to uh, teach them to pray. You'll find that in Luke uh, chapter 11. They saw that uh, <clears throat> he was praying when the Holy Spirit came on him at his baptism. They saw that he prayed after feeding the 5,000. They saw that he prayed all night before, or at least they knew he prayed all night before he uh, chose his disciples. He was praying when he was transfigured. He said, demons can't be cast out without prayer and fasting. He said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. And of course, his most notable prayer experience was in the Garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion. And the thing we have to understand about prayer uh, is prayer is... Uh, not just preparation for the battle ahead. Prayer is the battle. Uh, if you turn to Mark chapter 14, verses 33 and following, or especially verse 33, uh, it says that there in the garden, he began to be sore amazed and very heavy. Now that word sore amazed, if you study it, it means he was stricken with terror and horror 
and was desperately depressed. Now, we never think of Jesus having that kind of an experience. Now, I know, know if I was going to be crucified, I certainly would uh, have that. Uh, I'd be horrified. I'd be depressed. Uh, uh, that, that would be the battle I would have to fight. And so Jesus fought that battle in the garden. And then when he left the garden, we see him struggling there. And uh, it says he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. I mean, this was a real struggle. But then he left the garden, and we see him at the crucifixion with perfect poise. We don't see any struggle. We see he had command of, of every word, every action uh, through that horrible experience. And uh, so that, that's a tremendous lesson that the battle is fought in, our, in, in prayer. If we don't fight that battle, we go out like the disciples did from the Garden of Gethsemane, and they all scattered and Peter, of course, denied Christ, and uh, they just simply uh, fell apart, uh, and, and they weren't the one being crucified. Uh, so I think that's a good example of what happens when we don't prepare ourselves in prayer. Uh, and Jesus said that uh, demons are cast out by prayer and fasting. That doesn't mean when you're casting out a demon, you start praying and fasting. You don't have time to. Uh, what he meant was that should be your way of life so that when you meet those kinds of situations, you're prepared. Uh, for the uh, for the crisis, so th th this this is a tremendous important part of our lives. We've heard this uh, probably all our life that prayer is very important. But I just really want to emphasize from the example of Jesus uh, how important that was and and what it accomplished for him. In fact, Samuel said to Israel one time, he said, "God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you." Now, most of us don't think about uh, prayerlessness as sin. But if sin means to miss the mark, which is what it means, uh, then to be prayerless is to be sinning, is, is to be missing the mark. And uh, that's what Samuel was saying. So Jesus gave this, this wonderful prayer, uh, which the Anabaptists actually used for instruction. You can actually find some Anabaptist documents where they go through this prayer and use it to instruct their applicants as to what it really means to live the Christian life. So this was a very important uh, part of our uh, history. Uh, the Lord's Prayer has always been important to our people, but probably more important to our Anabaptist forefathers than it has been to us even. And the disciples learned to pray um, as Jesus taught them because they, they demonstrated by the lives they lived uh, after, uh, afterward that they had learned to pray. Now, this prayer is all-inclusive. It includes the past. It asks uh, God to forgive our sins, the, 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 the missing of the mark. Uh, it's a broad statement that says, God, forgive us for uh, the imperfections and the sins that we've committed. It uh, takes in the present. It asks for bread, which I think is symbolic of all the provisions we need, not just the food we eat. And it also takes in the future. It asks uh, for deliverance from uh, temptation and from sin. So it encompasses the past, the present, and the future. It's, it's all inclusive. So what do we learn from this prayer? Well, I'm going to go through it in, uh, in detail with, with the wording. The first thing we learned is, that we learn as we look at this prayer is we should pray as sons. It does not say... Uh, uh, well, I, 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 I shouldn't have said that. We pray as sons. We say father, okay? And so right away, we, we have this conception that uh, he is, as a child regards a father, a, a child regards a father as someone who is always right. Uh, a father can be even uh, abusive. And psychologists will tell you that the child will say that it's their fault. They, they never blame the parent. Uh, a father can uh, be dead wrong, and the child believes the father. I mean, that's that's just the, the nature of children, that they, they have absolute faith in their father. Uh, in fact, I had a, a, a seventh grade teacher who said that um, her father read to her a story before she went to bed one night. It was a story about an elephant. And just to be silly, like parents sometimes do, he, the whole way through, he pronounced it elephant instead of elephant. And uh, by coincidence, the next morning, the teacher read a story about an elephant. 
And of course she pronounced it correctly. And uh, the first time she said elephant, uh, my teacher's little hand went up. Teacher, you're saying that wrong. It's elephant. And uh, the teacher tried hard to explain that no, that, that she was pronouncing it right. And my seventh grade teacher uh, told us that the, the, her teacher never convinced her. Uh, she was sure that the teacher was wrong because her father had said elephant. Uh, that, that illustrates the, the total trust that a child has. In fact, uh, if you talk to a child when there's a divorce, they say, the child, one of the things children experience when there's a divorce is they experience a tremendous amount of guilt because they, they feel that their they're, uh, little uh, wrongs that uh, caused their parents all this, uh, you know, they saw their parents upset because they, they, they didn't always do things right. So they blame themselves that because of their misbehavior, whatever it was, that's why the marriage uh, was destroyed. So I'm, I'm just trying to show you the kind of absolute trust that a child has in a father. And so that's what uh, we say when we say father, uh, and he wants us to be children. He wants us to have that kind of absolute confidence in him that whatever he says is, is right. Whether we understand it, whether the people agree with us, whether it's going to uh, look like a good thing or a bad thing for us to uh, do what he says, we just do what he says. We believe him absolutely uh, and don't question. And so that's the, that's the kind of relationship we're, we're implying when we say our father. We are implying that kind of trust in God. <clears throat> uh, so uh, it, this is a privileged relationship. Because our father, in fact, does own the entire universe. And there's a song in our hymnal that says, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. And so uh, Jesus encouraged us to continue to ask, to continue to seek, to continue to knock. And by the way, those ETH words in the King James Version often mean that special Greek verb that means continual action. Uh, not, not always, but uh, that's one of the reasons I like the King James Version, because those ETH words uh, uh, suggest that continuous action. And so Jesus, we're told, hey, everyone that asketh, everyone that asketh continues to ask. Everyone that continues to seek, everyone that continues to knock will receive. So, so you say, well, why doesn't God give uh, what we ask sometimes? Well, I think he does. I think we always receive. Maybe not exactly what we ask. Uh, parents uh, uh, sometimes don't give children what they ask. They give them what they know they need, uh, which sometimes is very different from what they ask. And sometimes I think God does not answer our prayers because we don't continually ask. Uh, it's not that God has to be persuaded. It's that he wants something to happen to us. I give the illustration sometimes. If my son came to the table and he said, uh, Dad, I want a bicycle. Most parents would let that go in one ear and out the other. Uh, but then the next night he says, Dad, I want a bicycle. And uh, with a little bit more emphasis. If uh, for the next 30 to, uh, days, every night at the uh, table, he, he asks and it gets stronger and stronger. And finally says, Dad, I need a bicycle and begins to describe the, the need. Uh, at the end of that, the dad will probably say, you know what? If I bought this boy a bicycle, I think he really would use it and appreciate it. And I think that's a little bit the way it is with God. He knows that we need sometimes to come to terms with how desperately we really do want something. And I don't know about you, but there are many times that there were situations that I prayed for once or twice a week, maybe. And then later I thought, well, you know, I, I haven't been praying about that. Uh, and so God doesn't take us sometimes any more seriously. I think sometimes that we take our own requests. So we learn to pray as to a father, uh, the second one is, we pray as brothers. This prayer has not one singular pronoun. It's our Father. It's, uh, uh, it never has I, it never has me, it never has mine. It's, they're all plural pronouns. And our Anabaptist forefathers uh, had a statement. Uh, it said this, no man can come to God except to bring his brother with him. And I think a lot of people, uh, here's a little visual. Uh, I think a lot of people's concept of the Christian life is that we're individually coming to God. There's just an awful lot of individualism in many people's uh, concept of, of Christianity. But the Anabaptists uh, had this idea that here we are and we all 
come to God together. Now, that doesn't mean that when you pray, you have to go get all your brothers to pray with you. But what it does mean is when you're praying, your brothers are all there in, in focus. And if there's some brother that you have a wrong relationship with, uh, Jesus said you need to go make that right before you come to the altar. And so, in a sense, if you're in a church and uh, there's something uh, that is wrong between you and a brother, uh, you're not going to be successful in your prayer. Uh, and, and that's another thing I think that uh, we don't take seriously. Uh, there's so much relationship problems. In fact, we had a little family get together last night and, and you know, there was ver various things discussed where people didn't, weren't getting along. They weren't doing uh, well in their relationships. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of prayers aren't answered because God says, look, you get all your relationships right. And then you come to me uh, in prayer. So <clears throat> we pray as brothers the, in Ephesians it says that we will comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the depth and the length and the height. And so God, God takes us very seriously in our relationships with our brother. If you turn to 1 John chapter 2, uh, it says if we, uh, let me read that. Uh, I want to get it exactly the way it says it. This really convicted me some years ago when I read this. Uh, it says, he that loveth his brother abideth in the light. Now listen to this. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. That's quite a statement. Is it true that all sin stems from some wrong relationship somewhere in one's life? It says, if we, walk in the, if we love our brother, we walk in the light, and there's not any occasion for stumbling in us. That's an amazing statement. And so this aspect, this part of the prayer puts tremendous emphasis on having a proper relationship with our brother. And, uh, and I, I, you know, we're, we're really getting into some uh, practical stuff in this prayer. Our relationship with God, absolute trust, all clear relationships with brothers. Uh, Christians simply do not uh, tolerate bad relationships in their life. Uh, in our community, there's someone that's a very close friend of mine. In fact, he's probably one of my closest friends. And he's probably the person that I disagree with the most on one of the most important issues in our lives. But we love each other. And uh, I'm not sure if we'll ever completely agree, but uh, there, there's, nothing, there's nothing between us as far as our relationships are concerned. Now, unfortunately, I, I haven't always been able to say that, but it's something we should take very seriously, our relationship with our brother. <clears throat> In fact, if you turn to 1 John, you'll find that John uh, discusses a lot of things. And then three times in the book, he dips down for an illustration. And every time, the practical illustration for what John is teaching in 1 John is love, love for the brother. And, and he makes it very clear that if you don't love your brother, you have violated whatever he has taught. That's the practical application. He gives no other practical applications. The only practical application John gives in 1 John is that we must love our brother. And if we don't love our brother, he says, then everything else is out the window. You're, you're really not living the gospel if you don't love your brother. The third thing we find in this prayer, which art in heaven, we pray with reverence. We realize that God is the great other uh, and that uh, he is not like us. In fact, in, in Psalm chapter 50, down near the end of the chapter, it says that people who worship idols the problem is they thought that God was altogether like they are. They were. That was the problem. They brought God down to their level. Now, Jesus came down to our level, but he didn't come down to our level <laughs> to stay on our level. He came down to our level to lift us up into the level uh, of God. And so uh, we need to remember that God is in heaven and uh, he is the great other. And we don't see anything properly unless we see it from that heavenly perspective. I often think of uh, the example of the spies when they went into the land of Canaan. Uh, ten of them, of course, had, uh, they all saw the same thing. They, they, all, they all saw the same information. They all looked at the same uh, settings. But they came back with two very different reports. The ten said, this is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. Now, I don't know what was happening in that land. I don't know if they were killing each other. I don't know if there was a plague. But they said, look. If we go into that land, we're going to die. We saw it with our own eyes. The other two saw the same thing. 
And they said, well, you don't understand. These people are bred for us. God is getting this land ready for us, and that's why they're dying. You don't understand. You don't have the right perspective on this uh, uh, death that's taking place in, 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 in the land. God is getting it ready for us. Now, why did they say, why did they have a different perspective? Because they believe that God had told them to go in and take the land. And so that was the only way they could figure it out. That if they were to go in and take the land, then the death of those people in the land didn't mean they were going to die. It meant God was preparing it for them. And I just give that as an example of how uh, the Christian's perspective is altogether different. If he remembers that we have a father in heaven, he has a total perspective. And I say it many times in our, uh, my conversations with people on the telephone from the billboards. Uh, I say, look, I can give you some suggestions about this hard question you've asked me, but don't expect me to completely answer it because my perspective is not large enough. There is a larger perspective that we do not see. And that's why we have to trust in uh, many areas of our life. <clears throat> so uh, the heathen concept of God is to manipulate God. The Christian's concept of God is to explicitly trust and obey God. And I feel that even a lot of Christians, in fact, when I talk to them, you know, they want me to pray that something will happen, that God will do something for them. And I often think that, you know, we get into this thing of trying to manipulate God. That's a heathen. That's a heathen concept of God. Christians do not manipulate God. They try to get themselves in harmony with God. They try to cooperate with God. They don't manipulate God. So <clears throat> it's the God is in heaven. So we, we pray with reverence. The second thing that we learn is we pray for reverence. We pray that we will reverence God more. Hallowed be thy name. Uh, we will never make any progress spiritually until we come to terms with God's holiness. We go back to first John again. John makes a tremendous promise early on in his uh, uh, book. He says, I, I wrote this to you that you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship with the Father. I wrote this to you that you may be filled with joy. And you read those first verses and you say, this is tremendous. I want that kind of relationship. I want the joy. I want all this that John is talking about. But then you get to verse, uh, I think it's verse five, where he says, this then is the message that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And then John gets very serious about taking sin seriously and committing ourselves to holiness. And so, uh, our experience with God is all wrapped up in our pursuit of holiness. Many people think that the goal in life is to get to heaven. Jesus said at the end of chapter five in, in uh, Matthew, he says, be ye perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. And we shy away from that word perfect. But the fact is the Christian life is a call to perfection. Be ye holy for I am holy. Paul says, I labor to present every man perfect in Christ. Now we never completely attain that. But that is the passion that God wants to see, that we really do want to be absolutely perfect. And we are keenly aware when we're not, and, and we deal with it when we're not. But the, the Christian life is a commitment to holiness. It's a commitment to the character of God. And, and I think that we should be very uh, uh, solicitous about God's character. I think we should be, well, pardon my problem with my suspender here. <laughs> I I think we should be uh, very careful. We, we don't want in any way to besmirch his character. Uh, people look at us and they get their concept of God from us. I mean, that Westboro Baptist Church, I don't know how many times people bring that up on the telephone, this awful church that uh, goes uh, to places and, and says, God is judging you and, and gives all kinds of horrible concepts of what, uh, of, of what kind of person God is. Uh, we, we need to always be careful to, to sanctify the uh, impression that people have of God. Oh, to be like thee is a song that I've always enjoyed. Uh, pure as thou art. What is holiness? You know, at Eastern Mennonite College years ago, uh, they were trying to, uh, one of the classes was trying to do a motto and uh, they uh, couldn't decide whether they wanted the motto to say wholeness or holiness. Uh, I forget what the motto was, but uh, they could choose one of those two words, wholeness or holiness. Well, the fact of the matter is they both mean the same thing. Uh, the word holy is from the uh, Greek word halic, which means health. And so 
people shy away from the word holiness. It's a wonderful word. It means complete liberty. It means complete fulfillment. It means complete success. It means complete power. It means complete peace. It, it means to be completely whole. That's what the word holiness means. And we should have a passion for that. Uh, that should be our, our passion. And the Bible says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And there, cleanseth, see that E-T-H word? It's a constant cleansing. And uh, it's just a blessing to me to know that even the sins I commit never appear on the record. They're cleansed by the blood of Christ if I'm walking in the light. Now, of course, if I'm walking in the light and I realize I've sinned, I go deal with it. I don't get careless about it. People are a little afraid of this concept because they're afraid if you talk about this continual cleansing so that no sin ever appears on your record, that then people get careless. Well, then they're not walking in the light. So it's sort of a catch-22 verse. You can't play games with that verse. But if you are walking in the light, there is no condemnation to those who walk in the spirit. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Nothing ever comes between us and God if we walk in the light. So the Christian life is a commitment to holiness. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing. And, and we, should, uh, we should love that word. The fifth thing we pray for, thy kingdom come. We pray for a realization of Christ's kingdom. God's first priority on this earth is his kingdom, not my personal salvation. It doesn't say, seek ye first to get to heaven. Seek ye first to escape hell. In fact, Jesus didn't say, repent if you want to go to heaven. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the first thing he said in his ministry. And it is a mystery to me how the Christian gospel, even in our own uh, circles, got changed into what I call a save me gospel, which ended up with a whole bunch of individualism and, and, and I think the apostasy that took place in the church. Uh, God's first priority is the kingdom. He saves me because he can't have a redeemed society unless he has redeemed people. I don't think God saves us primarily to get us to heaven. I think he saves us primarily because the thing that he wants more than anything else in relation to, to this present time is little colonies of heaven that demonstrate the lost ideals that God had for man and for society. So the world can look in and say, yeah, that's what down deep in my heart, I know humanity should be. I want to be part of that. Uh, but there's just, to me, there's just so much individualism in Christianity. It's all about me. It's all about me getting to heaven. And uh, if there's one thing that I hope my life accomplishes, and that is that it, it, it does something about that problem and begins to change our people to a kingdom gospel. Uh, that verse in Philippians says, our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, I like that. Uh, it pictures a colony. And Philippi was an example of that. Philippi was a Greek city in the mid, I'm sorry, a Roman city in the midst of a Greek culture. If you walked to Philippi, you, walk, you saw on the way, you saw Roman law, you saw Roman dress, you heard the Latin language. But the minute you stepped inside of the city, it was Greek. It was Greek uh, law. It was Greek custom. It was Greek uh, uh, dress. And did the people in that city, like many Christians, say, oh, my, I, I have to be so different in the midst of all this uh, surrounding culture? No. They, they took it as a matter of honor that they could be Romans in the midst of this Greek culture. Romans were superior to the Greeks. <clears throat> Everybody else was barbarians except, except the people in Philippi. And, uh, and I think that, that should be our concept, that, that we have the opportunity to be part of the ideal society that God always intended, that Jesus now made possible by removing the problem, which is selfishness. And by the way, that's... that's I've come to believe that the word selfishness is a synonym for sin. That's really what sin is. It's selfishness. That's what we have to do to get rid of it, put self on the cross. And it, to me, it's such a privilege to live with the genuine antidote for selfishness and sin and be able to live out this ideal that God always had for humanity. Most Christians do not think about that. They don't think about that as a tremendous privilege to be holy, to have holy relationships and to enjoy what humans were always intended to experience. So, <clears throat> so we pray for a realization of his kingdom. I hope you're getting this, that this prayer really does zero in on, on, on the, all the important aspects of life. And so we come to the next one, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven or in earth as it is in heaven. Uh, <clears throat> we pray for obedience. God has no plan of salvation for the unsurrendered will. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For someone to be willful against God or against a reality, uh, there's no place. God has no place for that in, in, his, in his plan. So people say, well, how do I know the will of God? Well, I, I've come up with three, three things that I always say. First of all, and this is axiomatic, it's not the will of, it's, it's not, uh, the will of God if it contradicts anything that uh, God said. Uh, the Anabaptists had a, a, a statement, no understanding of the scripture is the proper understanding if it contradicts anything Jesus said or did. And that, that, that's important. Well, you say, well, we all know that. Well, I'm not sure we all know it. Uh, we sometimes uh, uh, pray for God's will uh, for things that we should know better. I mean, it's just, sometimes it's a little bit like uh, you're, you, you, you go to a bank and you see a man uh, uh, in front of the door on his knees just praying his heart out. And you say, what are you praying for? And he says, well, I'm, I'm praying to find out if it's God's will for me to rob this bank. And you would say, come on. But people do that all the time. I, I, you know, I prayed and God told me that uh, I didn't need to wear my covering anymore. I, I prayed and God, uh, <clears throat> I, I prayed uh, all kinds of prayers that people pray. Uh, I prayed and God led me to go to the army. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> nothing is the will of God if it contradicts anything that, that God has said, especially what Jesus said. Uh, the second thing that I think if we're going to know the will of God, we need to commit ourselves to doing it before he shows it to us. It says, if any man will know, uh, if any man will do his will, he will know whether my doctrine is of me or whether it comes from the Father. I sometimes illustrate it this way. Uh, some people say, well, God, I want you to, uh, to show me your will. Here, here's a piece of paper. Would you write your will on it for me? You to list it down here. And God says, well, first of all, do you see this little line at the bottom? Well, when you sign your name to that line, then I will start writing what I want you to do. And so I think we will know God's will uh, to the extent that we've committed ourselves to do it before he shows it to us. Because often he shows us things we really don't want to hear. After having done them, we're glad we did them and we see the, some wisdom in it. But often they don't look like something uh, that we would have ever wanted to do. And the last thing. So the first thing is nothing's the will of God if it contradicts anything that God has said. Number two, God probably isn't going to show us his will unless we are committed to do it before he shows it to us. And the last one <clears throat> is he shows his will to people who are committed to pleasing him. There's a difference between obeying and pleasing. Uh, and we talk a lot about obedience, but I think we should be talking more about pleasing God. If, uh, if I go to town and I tell one of my children, now when I come home, I want the dishes washed and I want your room straightened up. And they do that. That's obedience. But if while I'm in town and they wash the dishes and they straighten up their room and then they say, you know what? Dad said he wanted me to uh, uh, weed the garden. Now it's a hot day and I hate to weed the garden. It's the last thing on my list to do that I would want to do. But I want to really make mom and dad happy when they come home from town. So I'm going to weed the garden, even though they didn't tell me to. That's the kind of obedience that God wants. He, he loves people who please him. David one time said, I want to build God a temple. And uh, God sent Nathan. And Nathan said, yeah, go ahead. And then you know what happened in the night? God said, no, no, you go tell David tomorrow that uh, uh, he's not going to build the temple. But it's interesting what, what Nathan said to David. He said, did God ever tell anybody he wanted a temple? Now, you look at what God told the children of Israel. He never gave them plans for a temple. He gave them plans for a tabernacle, and he was perfectly happy to dwell in that tabernacle. He never, there's, there's not, nothing in his commands to Israel that he wanted a temple. And so what God says to David, he says, it really makes me happy, David, that you wanted to build a temple. I never said I wanted one, but you understood that that would please me. And because you wanted to please me, I'm not going to let you build me a temple, but I'm going to build you a house. And that's where God made the promise that David would always have one of his descendants sitting on the throne of Israel. 
uh, that pleased God so, so completely that he made that tremendous promise to David. And so I think we should think in terms of pleasing God. What will put a smile on God's face? We should understand. David was a man after God's own heart. David wasn't interested just in obeying God. He wanted to know the heart of God. He wanted to go there and please God. He wanted to, to, to uh, uh, put joy in God's heart. The next thing we pray for is necessities. Give us, notice that plural word. So you brought your paycheck home. What, is it your paycheck? No, it's our paycheck. And that's another thing we don't think about. We tend to think that what we have is ours. <laughs> I mean, mine. No, give us this day our daily bread. When you bring that paycheck home, that belongs to the entire brotherhood. It's not your paycheck. And it's daily bread. So if you want to talk about non-accumulation of wealth, there it is. Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, the Bible says we're uh, uh, to go to the ant. Well, you say, well, the ant lays up for the future. But where's the ant's future? It's on this earth. We're supposed to lay up for the future too. But where is our future? It's not on this earth. In fact, he says, lay up treasure in heaven. It's not wrong to accumulate wealth. We're supposed to accumulate all the wealth we possibly can, but we're not to accumulate it here. And so <clears throat> we pray, give us this day our daily bread. So we, you bring the paycheck home. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the entire brotherhood. And how should you feel about that? Well, if you go to 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 9, verse 8, Paul's giving a lot of teaching there on uh, uh, giving. And uh, <clears throat> he says that we're supposed to be cheerful givers. Well, if you look that word cheerful up, <laughs> it's the Greek word hilaros. It's the word we get hilarious from. Uh, God wants us to be hilarious givers. Uh, I tell people that when the offering basket is passed at church, you should hear chuckles all up and down the pews as people are putting their money in. Uh, that should be our attitude toward giving. And the interesting thing is, the very next verse says, if you're a hilarious giver, this is how God responds. God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound unto every good work. Now, that's a fabulous promise, but don't take it out of context. It's in the context of people who are hilarious givers. If you're a hilarious giver, God is a hilarious giver. We often hear the statement, you can't outgive God. He, he opens up to the person who is a, is, is, a, is a joyful giver. He opens up all the resources he has lavishly. Uh, the word abound means no limits. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> uh, so we pray that God will give us our daily bread, us, our daily bread. And, we, 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 and if every Christian practices this, there would be no need for accumulation on this earth because my resources would be your resources. And likewise, every, you know, there would be a constant uh, giving and, and, and meeting all of the needs and nobody would need to accumulate anything. One of the dreams we had when we started our church, which was never realized, is that all of us would get out of debt. And if somebody needed housing, we would all just take up the money and, and, and pay cash for it. Uh, that was a rather radical concept that we got a lot of interesting press on. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> uh, that is how it would work. You know, if nobody's in debt, then in the next six months, we probably, not a very large congregation, could, could come up with the money to buy a house for somebody uh, with cash. Uh, <clears throat> but unfortunately, uh, we had so many people come into our circles that had so much debt that uh, we spent a lot of time paying off debt and never were able to realize that, that ideal. The next thing we pray for is for forgiveness. <clears throat> Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, forgiveness is the basis of all human relationships. I want you to think about this. We're all human. We're all imperfect. We're all going to disappoint each other. We're probably all going to hurt each other till it's all done. And if we don't let if we don't learn to forgive, human relationships will suffer. And the reason why we don't 
so readily forgive is because it is so unjust. If you forgive somebody, it means you took all the hurt, you took all the indignation, and you let the other person go free as if it never happened. That's what Jesus did for us. Now, that doesn't mean you can't challenge the other person. Uh, Joseph did. He put his brothers through the paces because he wanted reconciliation. He, did, he had already forgiven them. There was no question about Joseph's forgiveness. But reconciliation is, is something else. Uh, you can forgive, but unless the other person takes his responsibility, the relationship will never be what it should be. So we sometimes have a, a, a responsibility to find very creative ways to bring that other person to a sense of his responsibility. But we never do it by putting hurt on the other person uh, uh, out of revenge. And so <clears throat> forgiveness is the basis of all human relationships. And I say this in every wedding message. I know you people are standing in front of this altar with all kinds of fuzzy feelings and you have no concept that you'll ever hurt each other, but you will. And you might as well make up your mind before it happens what you're gonna do. You're just gonna let it go as if it never happened. And uh, <clears throat> that's a hard thing to do. My children would say to me, but dad, you don't know what they did to me. And I said, well, that's what forgiveness is, what they did to you. <laughs> I mean, if, if they hadn't done anything to you, you wouldn't need to forgive. I mean, that is precisely what it is. It's uh, learning to take it uh, and uh, let the other person go free. And Jesus makes a, a tremendous statement here in the Lord's Prayer. He says, forgive us just like we forgive others. Now, the, the, the concept of forgiveness is to set somebody free not to hold them in, in uh, uh, to blackmail them because they did this wrong. It's to let the other person go free. So the concept of forgiveness is freedom. And Jesus says, if you don't let other people go free, you won't be free. And I honestly believe that a lot of people's addictions, depression, loneliness, insecurity, inferiority is based on their inability to set other people free. And God says, if you're going to keep other people in a cage, then you're going to stay in the cage. Corey Ten Boom tells the story of a dream she had one night where the, uh, her worst enemy was in a cage. And she was going around this cage, punching him with a stick. And, of course, he couldn't get away. And God told her in the dream to let him out of the cage. And, of course, she didn't want to do that because it was just too good to have him in, uh, under her control. But finally, she said, OK, Lord, I will. And he gave her the key, and this is in her dream. She opened the cage, and out came Corey. She was the person in the cage. And I really think that's, that's, that's a tremendous metaphor as to what happens when we don't forgive. And if we really believed this, we would go and be desperate to make all our relationships the way they should be by forgiving people. Uh, <clears throat> this is our most powerful testimony. When the nickel mines uh, situa uh, forgiveness situation took place, I had a friend who, who uh, had a grandmother in Britain and he'd gone there to visit her and he was there for a year. And he was there during the time that this happened. And he called me and he told me, John, he said, this incident of the Amish at nickel mines has been front page news in the London newspapers for a whole week. People just could not believe that somebody could let so, something so terrible just go not seek any way to put any hurt back on anybody else. Uh, <clears throat> and there could be many illustrations. You know, it's interesting, but when we hear those stories, <laughs> it warms our hearts because so somehow forgiveness is just such a beautiful thing. So then why don't we, why don't we so readily, why don't we readily do it? Why do we have this tendency to hold grudges? When we hear uh, people holding grudges, it gives us an ugly feeling. We don't, we don't feel happy about that. And uh, so uh, we pray uh, for, that we will be able to forgive or, and be forgiven. <clears throat> the next thing we pray is we pray against temptation. Now, we don't pray to be delivered from trials. We are promised we're going to have trials. Our faith is the most, uh, personally, is the most precious thing to God. And, <clears throat> you know, if you have a precious metal, we all know. <clears throat> what they do to refine that metal. They put it under tremendous heat. And God will try our faith. He, tr he, he allowed Job to be tried. Uh, he, you know, Paul <laughs> and then Paul says, Paul, Paul got this idea. He says, I glory in tribulations. Read Romans chapter five. 
I, I'm not going to ask you folks to raise your hands, but I don't know how many of you glory in tribulations. I, I haven't quite gotten there yet. But Paul says he glories in tribulations because it works patience, and patience gives him character, and character gives him hope. And out of all that preparation, he's able to love. Oh, uh, that's tremendous. So we will, we will be put under trial. But what happens in temptation is we're in the trial and we refuse to allow the trial to, to have its work in our hearts. And we start blaming God or blaming other people, getting on the telephone. That's where it, that's where it morphs from a trial into temptation. In fact, it says we're to be harmless as doves toward people. And we're to be reverent toward God. We're never to blame God. In fact, that, that's an awful sin to blame God. But people do. Why did God allow this to happen to me? Well, if that's the kind of God, I hear that all the time. Uh, so we pray that we will not lose faith in God and we will not lose faith in people. We pray to be guarded against temptation because our trials very quickly lead us into doing wrong things. And uh, we, we, we find ourselves in sin. We don't, we, the trial does not make us better. It makes us, like people say, bitter. And, and that's what we're praying against. We blame God. Uh, <clears throat> so, but we're up against tremendous odds. It says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers. There's a song in our hymn that says, uh, 10,000 foes arise to draw me from the skies. Well, there probably are at least that many. And our deepest dread should be sin. That should be our deepest dread. Uh, and I like the song that I have in my hymnal. I want a principle within a watchful, godly fear, a sensibility to, of sin, a pain to feel it near. Help me the first approach to feel of pride or wrong desire, to catch the wandering of my will, and quench the kindling fire. Uh, you can say whatever you want to about the Wesleys, but there are two things that uh, the Wesleys would teach us. Number one is a passionate devotion for Christ. And number two is a hatred for sin. Holiness and uh, worship were the two things the Wesleys emphasized and, and practiced. So we pray against temptation that we will not in the trial begin to uh, react wrongly toward God or toward men. And then we pray for deliverance. <clears throat> Deliver us from evil. Uh, I think this is the self, self, subconscious cry of every person, the freedom to be our best. I like that song in our hymnal. It says, oh, life in whom is life indeed, through whom our best desires are freed. Stir thou that life in us, we pray. We come to thee. We come to thee. I think every person wants to conquer pain, bitterness, disappointment, worry, loneliness, poverty, broken dreams, and hopes. We all want to be delivered from those things. I mean, even, even sinners want to be delivered from those things I just listed. And the th wonderful thing about Jesus is he, he never denied the reality of sin. You know, we live in a world where people have denied the reality of sin. I talk to people all the time. Well, I don't need Jesus. I'm a good person. I know I can make good decisions. I, I you know, I, I'm a good person. Jesus did not assume that we were good people. He, he assumed that, that sin was a reality that we had to deal with. But he assured us that God was on our side and we could conquer evil and we could be delivered from it. And that's why we pray this prayer. And then we end the prayer by saying, thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We must remember that this kingdom is not ours. It's God's kingdom. And we so quickly want to take control. We so quickly want to organize this and make it work in the way we want it to work. The first usage of this word in the Old Testament says that we will be a kingdom of priests unto God. It's his kingdom. We are only mediating this kingdom. We're only allowing God to express this kingdom through us to the world around us. It's his kingdom. And we need to always remember that we can't take this kingdom and make it something we want it to be. We have to let it be God's kingdom. And so this is just a wonderful prayer. I hope, I hope you've been impressed like I always am when I go through this. This covers every area of life. Uh, I have them listed here somewhere. Um, it's probably, yeah, here it is. We pray as brothers. We pray 
uh, as sons. We pray for reverence. We pray with reverence. We pray that God's kingdom will be realized. We pray that we will obey. We pray for daily necessities. We pray for forgiveness. We pray against temptation. We pray for deliverance. What more would you add to that list? That covers all of human experience in a most penetrating, practical way. So now maybe you have some questions. <clears throat> Let's learn to pray the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> uh, the early church prayed it at least three times a day. Uh, I don't think I managed to do that. I, I pray it when I have my prayer time in the morning, I always begin with the Lord's Prayer. And I try to concentrate on the, what I just told you when I'm praying it. Uh, will you tell us what hymn it is that has the remark of you're praying to a king to take large, uh, make large prayers? <laughs> I can't think of the first words. You know how that is. You try to think of a song and you can't think of the first words. But I'll try to get that to you, Dan. Okay. Because uh, starts... I, I just found that gave me a spark when you said that. Yeah. When, when we pray... Uh, at, in our Sunday morning meetings, uh, we uh, we have prayer requests, and uh, some of them are like big, and I just find them overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, pray for uh, our situation with the with the virus. Yeah. Oh my! What a monstrous uh, snafu! that is on top of a really hideous infectious disease. Yes. Another one is Honduras. Um, oh man, you know, if you want, if you have a family that you want to pray for because they've been washed out, well, you know, you can think of, you can enumerate things uh, to request, but for a whole country, oof. So it was encouraging. I wish that that was somewhere in scripture. Uh, you have a copy of my hymnal, don't you, Dan? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. 823. Come, my soul, thy suit prepare. Jesus loves to answer prayer. He himself has bid thee pray, rise and ask without delay. Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. Wow. Guess who's guess which congregation is probably going to sing that the next time somebody said, Does anybody have a request? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 823. Yes, so that's what you're going to suggest they say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep, thank you. You're welcome. I hasten to say that I have not uh, learned to pray this prayer uh, like we should pray, but I, I keep working on it. Uh, I have I have written uh, some alternative verses to sweet hour of prayer. And okay. one of them says, uh, shall we present our covet list when we, our Lord's prime one have list, have, have missed, shall let my lips of request be dumb till I have prayed thy kingdom come. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Sometimes I catch myself violating that and, and, uh, <clears throat> but it's, it's there to keep me, Steer me back. <clears throat> Someone has observed in Luke 11, where Jesus talks about persistence in prayer, and he gives the Lord's Prayer. He says, uh, how much more shall your Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And someone has suggested that all of our requests actually are requests for a ministry of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit ministers almost everything that we need. Uh, so we're promised that God will give us that enabling uh, agent the holy spirit for every request well now that's a very interesting perspective i never thought of that even though one of my favorites ministers says 
uh, make friends with the Holy Spirit because he is the one who disperses all the blessings. Thank you, John, for, for that message. Um, it always touches me. And I would have grown up um, not, not um, saying that or praying that prayer um, a lot. I don't believe. I don't remember. Um, but in the last five years, our congregation, every Sunday, we say this together. as a con- or We pray this together. Someone said we don't say it, we pray it. <laughs> we pray this together as a congregation. And I've even tried in my own personal prayer life when I, when I just don't know what to pray or how to pray, I just start saying that prayer. And it, it's amazing uh, what that does. So We've um, sort of gotten ourselves in a frame of mind that uh, we need to pray spontaneous prayers, that they're more mm-hmm. real, that, that this mm-hmm. becomes just a perfunctory a ritual that's meaningless. Well, <laughs> Jesus told us to pray it. <laughs> and one thing I like about it is uh, often we pray out of God's will, but you're not praying out of God's will when you pray this prayer. And God says, if, if we pray in his will, he answers. Amen. Uh, so when I pray this prayer, I know at least when I'm praying the Lord's prayer that I'm praying it totally in the will of God. Well, I, I have to chasten myself, I think, from time to time against a perfunctory, a perfunctory recitation because I can whip that off in seconds. Yeah. And, and uh, it's, I feel like it is when I do that, it's no more than if I had somebody recording a recording on a audio cassette and I play the audio cassette, you know, it's just, it's just um, wiggles, magnetic wiggles on a piece of tape. Or if you would teach a, a parrot that, it wouldn't count. So, or if you put it on a prayer wheel like some heathen have. <laughs> so, well, you know, yeah. I often think that that, uh, that sometimes <laughs> those are a, a metaphor for uh, yeah. our shallowness of prayer. So, what I try to do is extension or elaboration. So, when I go through the Lord's prayer, I, I try to do that. You know, I find that pretty easy when it comes uh, uh, to on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, but other parts of it, I still, I still feel uh, deficient. So, uh, for example, hallowed be thy name. Well, you know, I can think of probably a, a half a dozen or a dozen synonyms for hallowed, but I don't feel like I really get it. In the, in the same comprehensive, exhaustive way that I do when I pray on earth as it is in heaven. I start with where I am and, and work up. <laughs> Somebody has ob- uh, observed, and I never studied this, that actually that should be translated, hallowed be thy name in us, that our expression should sh- should show the holiness of God. Ooh. I'll have to see if I can check that out. It's probably buried in the, in the form of the word. Yeah. You think? Because no, I, a lot of times, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> like they Greek, say, you have, Greek. you have to know the Greek. <laughs> it's amazing what you could do with Greek. <laughs> yeah. I sometimes say Greek is the last refuge of the heretic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been greatly moved this morning um, and challenged in hearing this. Um, I don't think I'll ever look at it this way or the same again, this prayer. Um, I knew it had a lot in it, but every aspect of life, um, it's fantastic. Is there any other questions? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, John, for pointing out First uh, John two ten. That I, I thanks for thanks for that uh, lifting that up. And the other thing I wanted to mention, John, is um, I was, sometimes I get a little uncomfortable with the um, the term in that prayer where it says, "Give me this, give us this day our daily bread." I just I guess I'm asking whether anybody else gets a little uncomfortable with, I guess 
I wish there was a softer way of asking for that. Does anybody else ever have that uh, feeling or is it just me? You think it sounds a little bit selfish? Well, I, I don't know. It just, I, I, it seems demanding. I, I wouldn't say it that way to my, my mom. Um, well, the key there is give us this day our daily bread. I mean, I have plenty of daily bread. It's all around my waist. It's hanging out over my belt. But when I pray that prayer, I'm done praying for me alone. I'm praying for every every saint all over the planet and every every continent in Oceania. Uh, and it what it does is it chastens me to think, uh, yeah, uh, be thou warmed and filled. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and not not do something about it. So I don't think that, that in that form it is uh, inappropriate or selfish. Then it's what God said to do. Back to the Wesleys. That's another area where they shown, or especially John. Uh, he really took seriously that uh, what he believed, what he owned, what he had was not his own. Uh, they say that in today's money, from the sale of his books, he would have had an income of about $140,000 a year. But in today's money, they, he took a salary of $14,000. And if you read his journal, he gave a, a, a significant amount of that away. Mm -hmm. uh, he really did take seriously. And I think of uh, the verse in Luke 16 that says, if you are not faithful in the unrighteous famine, who shall commit to your trust the true riches? And for all the disagreement I would have had with Wesley, the infant baptism, the membership in the Church of England, and I could say some other things where I, I don't feel uh, non-resistance was not a huge issue with them. But I think this one thing, God was able to just pour out blessings upon them because they got this one right. And this one is more important, I think, than most people realize. God looks at us and says, look, I've given them some stuff that's actually worthless. Yeah, I guess. I'm going to watch to see how, what they do with it. And then I'll decide whether I'm going to give them something that has true worth. Uh, and I think that's another explanation for a lot of uh, failure and powerlessness among Christians. John, could it be possible that this, that the request to give us our daily bread have a, actually a deeper dimension to it in the bread of Christ? Go ahead. I'm listening. Yeah, that's, I said it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think I, I, I did mention there that it, it, I don't think it just means bread. I think it means all of the provisions that we need for the day. Well, thank you, brother, for sharing with us this morning. Um, if there's no other questions, I'm sure we could go on. There's so many aspects of our lives that this prayer covers that we could discuss for hours, each individual one of them. Um, I know I'm challenged to, to rethink it. Um, before we go, I have an announcement to make for next weekend. I'm sure some of you have got the reminder for a special event we're holding next weekend on January 9th. Um, we plan to have two of these calls, one, the regular one at six o'clock in the morning. And there's going to be three different speakers in the morning. We're going to have Patrick Matthews and Andrew Kurtz are going to share about their food distribution. Um, actually, Patrick Matthews is going to Oh well, yeah, both of them are doing food distribution and, and Jonathan Heisey from Colorado is going to be sharing about his interactions and ministry with the international students in the morning. And in the afternoon, we are going to have a um, question and answer discussion with uh, David, David Berceau from um, Chambersburg, I believe. So be praying about that. And for the afternoon session, 
um, come with questions for that discussion. Um, am I getting everything for that, Brian? What time is it in the afternoon? Sorry, yes, three o'clock Eastern uh, time. I'll be taking no board calls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, it, would, it would actually be, we've had some questions roll in and if you, if you could get, if you have any specific questions uh, related to um, the circumstances of our day um, and how we move forward um, as, as Kingdom Christians, uh, specific and, and questions specifically for David Brousseau, for all of you, you know, who read his books, etc. Um, Sam and I are going to be moderating that call. It's going to be a little bit different configuration. You won't be able to ask questions live, um, but you'll be able to submit them uh, throughout the discussion uh, via the chat button here on on Zoom. Uh, that's how that's going to work. But um, but if you can get questions to us beforehand, that'll that'll be the best. We can kind of compile them and and be a little prepared. So, but yes, yeah, at three o'clock for. Um, basically one hour next letter. Thanks, Sam. Okay. Yeah, the title for the afternoon is Direction and Chaos, and that's in relation to um, the year we've had. I know it's a new year now, and the, the difficulties that it's created for the church and relating to those, the situation that we find ourselves in uh, globally. So I think that's it for us this morning. We thank you all for joining us. Thanks again, um, John, for sharing that. And before we go, I think we'll just close with the Lord's Prayer. So let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May you all go with God. Bless you all. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. <laughs>